Peter's uh, agreed to give us a bit of a talk on um, the fun of, Q of QRP. So uh, no further ado, I'll hand over to Peter. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Justin. And uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, well, fun of QRP. Well, some people think of QRP as uh, uh, bit of a, uh, a futile exercise, bang your head against the brick wall, you hear people moaning all about the bad band conditions and how they can't hear anyone and they expect even fewer would hear them, especially with low power. Tonight I'll talk about um, um, that you can still have fun even with low power and, uh, what, um, and some of the things you can do with it and particularly the promise of some of the new digital modes which I'll, uh, I'll talk about. Um, as to what is QRP, well, um, a lot of the QRP clubs around the world, there's no concrete definition, but they often go by 5 watts of CW, 10 watts of SSB, um, 5 watts digital modes. Um, that, that's like there are QRP awards you can get, QRP DXCC from the AWL. that's based on that sort of low power. Um, so roughly foundation license power or a bit less for CW. Um, you can do pretty much any amateur activity with QRP and uh, some activities are best done with QRP because of limitations with um, what you can take when you go portable. Um, so the sort of reasons, well maybe if we already worked DXCC with 100 watts, 400 watts, whatever, um, and uh, you want to do it again but have a bit of a challenge seeing if you can do it with low power, that might be one motivation. Homebrew gear, I find that um, building power amplifiers are always a bit of a trouble and they tend to have outputs on more frequencies than, uh, than what you're aiming at and, uh, and of course there's heat sink problems, you need more complicated power supplies or you could just be lazy and just uh, forget the final amplifier and just uh, connect your low pass filter up to your um, driver stage and then you have a QRP transmitter so um, when you're building a transmitter you start you know, you start from your lower level stages and then you, you, you get to you know when it's one two or five watts and you think that's enough I'll put it in a box and besides you've run out of um, room in your box to put all the other final stages so that's your project done and it's QRP so yet yeah, home brewing is a great strength of, um, of QRP um, you can get some incredibly simple designs that um, work quite well. Some are incredibly simple and do not work well. I'll talk about those later on. Um, QRP is great for battery or solar portable operating because you don't need to worry too much about huge generators or big power supplies. So it's just simple if you can take a small battery and you can be on the air for hours. Um, there are special awards, um, particularly summits of the air, which we have plenty of here in VK7, VKFF and national parks. Uh, a lot of people that go into those um, are operating QRP, particularly as they've just got a small station that they can carry. Um, weak signal data modes um, are hugely efficient. You can get uh, um, your tens of dB better off than SSB for a similar path and uh, QRP can work with those. And also HF pedestrian mobile, which I've done a bit of. Um, as to whether it works or not, um, it is probably a bit more subject to conditions than higher power. There's less leeway, particularly if the receiving station has more noise, but you can still have worldwide contacts on, um, um, on all modes. Um, easiest with digital modes, CW, then SSB. SSB is still possible, but certainly um, um, even despite the conditions that people talk about, routine contacts within VK and ZL are possible on all modes. Um, I find very rarely does one not make contacts, provided you pick your band right, your antenna right, time of day, and location can help as well. Um, and mobile and portable operating can be quite successful. And there's also the uh, thrill of contacts with gear that you've built yourself. Um, as to what you, um, as to what you can um, do with um, how to get started on QRP. Easiest is almost all 100 watt transceivers. You can turn the power down to five or 10 watts. And um, you, yes, you could make contact with 100 watts and then see if people can still hear you at five watts, even less. Um, one watt, 100 milliwatts, 20 milliwatts, you never know. Um, I've had SSB contacts with 20 milliwatts on 40 meters over hundreds of kilometers. So yep, that can uh, be possible. Um, another possibility, um, well, the 100 watt transceiver, the power reduced, the big issue with that 
especially if you're operating portable, is the receive current consumption. They can draw more power on receive than a dedicated QRP transmitter will use on transmit. So um, great for home use, um, maybe in the car, but for portable use, um, it's probably better to have a dedicated QRP rig. And I'll talk about some of the popular models later on. Um, you can get them either new or used, or you can even get kits, either kits that require very little electronics knowledge to put together, others a bit more sophisticated, or you can even build your own from scratch. Um, so there's huge choices with QRP. Um, as for QRP transceivers, um, the most famous is probably the FT817, FT818. If you've already got an FT817 ND, um, it's probably not worth getting an FT818. Um, the only difference I think um, is it might be one watt extra power. The battery pack, instead of being absolutely terrible, is now merely mediocre in its capacity. Um, um, yeah, I'll talk about powering QRP rigs later on. Um, but yeah, if, if you want a basic do anything, you'll do everything package, then the FT817 818 is a good choice. There's a new ICOM coming out, um, quite a bit more expensive, ICOM 705, um, that's a possibility. Um, but um, yeah, so the Yaesu is one choice. It's been around since um, 2001. So for a transceiver, if you think about, you know, you, we, we thought that the FT101 series lasted a long time in, in the 70s, 80s or whatever, you know, but the FT817 is probably Yaesu's longest running transceiver. Um, and if you count the 818, then it's been, it's been going for the better part of 20 years. So it's amazing. Um, and uh, then there's the Alicraft, if you've got a bit of money to burn. And, uh, um, and if, if, you, if you really look after your equipment, like there's some people that uh, have these nice cases and look after their equipment and only use them on, on parks. So the problem, um, Alicraft's a great rig as, as far as their RF performance goes. Um, um, you know, if, if you look at the specifications, yes, they are better than the FT817-818. Bit more output power, I think it's maybe 10 or 15 watts. They've got a speech processor, I think, on SSB. Bit lower receive current consumption, which is a big benefit. I think it's about 150 milliamps versus three or 400 for the 817. Um, but they don't have quite as many bands. They don't have the, you know, two, two meters, 70 centimeters. And also when you look at them, they look like, a, to my eyes, they look like a bit of Swiss cheese. Like you look at all the little holes around the size of, of a, a KX3 and you think if, if you're on a beach and it's blowing a gale and sand will get in absolutely everywhere um, and people you know see my videos and they see all this sand crusted around the display of my FT817 still hasn't missed a beat I, I would not dream of of getting an Ellie craft um, particularly given its price and taking it into the places that I go so if you are the type that um, you know, operates a long way from sand, you've got everything all in nice cases, everything's all in shelters and tents and things, um, um, then the Ellicraft might be a good rig, a good choice for you. Um, there's a KX2, which is like a junior KX3, a little bit smaller, um, fewer bands, but still um, a bit more expensive than the 817818. So good rig, but treat it carefully. Um, then there's other types, there's a Chinese model. Um, I don't know if it's still a current model. Um, it's only 80 through to 10 meters. Um, it's got a few rough edges. Um, you know, it's only got a small number of low pass filters. Um, before buying, yes, it is cheaper than the Yaesu, but I'd, I'd have a look at the reviews. Um, you know, people that comment, you might comment about usability, quality control, etc. So the ones I've heard have been on the air have sounded okay, but yeah, I, my bias would be towards the ASU. Then for the CW buff, there's um, these tiny LNR type transceivers. These are absolutely ideal if you want something that if you're going on a multi-day hike and you, yeah, every gram is is critical. Um, you've got a tiny thing. It's it's not much bigger than a matchbox. It covers you know three, four, five bands. It's CW only. Um, it's it's not cheap either. Three to four hundred dollars US. But on the other hand, it's um, um, if you're just CW, if you just want it to maybe keep skids with people. Um, the only thing is that, and I'll talk about that later on with the operating, and I write about it a lot in the book, a lot of QRP is actually listening, which means that you're tuning around the band, which means your ability to do that in a transceiver is really important. And when you look at the um, LNR, there's only, I can't see any tuning knob. I can only see up-down buttons. And I would imagine that, you know, 
I haven't heard of them being worn out, but if you are scanning the band in one kilohertz increments or whatever a lot, then um, I, I would rather a tuning knob for easy tuning around the various bands. Um, so maybe, for, so you wouldn't get it for if you're a hardcore contester or even a DXer, but if there are, if it's just, you know, if to activate a summit with the absolute least amount of um, equipment and very lightweight, then, and you're into CW, then that might be a good choice to, to go. Um, then there's also some QRP rigs in the um, used. Um, ICOM 703 from the 90s, that was, looks a lot like the ICOM 706, which is a very successful ICOM rig. Um, but they also had a QRP version. Um, you might sometimes see those on the second hand market. I think it only goes up to six meters, unlike the 706. Um, sound good on the air. They are quite heavy, especially compared with the 817 and they've got a bit more received current use. So um, um, maybe not the greatest for backpacking. Um, then of course, right, right at the bottom, and, and there's, oh, I noticed in the next room there, there's uh, the model up from this. This is the original FT7. Um, uh, weighs a ton, if you look at the volume of it, it's probably about you know, eight or 10 times the size, the volume of the 817. And it does half the number or a third the number of bands. Um, but, it, analog dial, but it's a good receiver. Um, and um, if, if you have, happen to have one you haven't used for years, then that is, is not a bad QRP rig. Um, so uh, there's uh, options with commercial like gear. The other possibility is something that involves your own practical involvement. Um, the Indian kit called the U Micro Bit X, um, 80 through to 10 meters. Though so bearing in mind that um, um, the power output does drop off at the higher frequency ranges so you'd mainly use it for 80 and 40 maybe 30 and 20 meters it's a pre-assembled kit from india designed by ashar farhan vu2 ese and it's pretty much all pre-assembled like you see all those surface mount parts all the toys that's all assembled when you get it um, and it's surprisingly low price um, it's a bit more than qrp output i, I think it depends on your um, supply voltage but i think it's like you know something like seven or eight maybe 10 watts um, and uh, there is a bit of soldering it probably takes a couple of hours you need to find your own box but you can get um, boxes that are, are made for it it won't be quite as small as the ft817 but it could be made lighter um, because there's only quite a small heat sink on the two final transistors on the right of the screen so you could possibly make it lighter than the 817. So that could be a consideration. Um, it's a little bit clunky on CW. Um, you know, um, I th and there are all sorts of mods. There's a huge user group, um, email lists, Facebook groups, all sorts of ideas and things like it's, um, uh, like if you're technically inclined and you like the idea of modifying little surface mount things, there were some issues with some of the various versions. I think we might be up to version five or six now. Um, but yeah, um, it's the great thing about it is it's very low price. So it's, um, and I've had some good contacts with it. Uh, another possibility um, is you could, um, a bit more personal involvement is get a, um, a full kit. Um, we have an Australia OzQRP, which is uh, basically Leon Williams um, VK2DOB. Um, I know that there are at least several of the MDT transceivers in Tasmania, um, I've worked uh, one or two from Melbourne. Um, that is basically a little 40 meter double sideband transceiver. It puts out a, a couple of watts and it uses a ceramic resonator. So it doesn't cover all of the band. Um, there are mods you can do to cover about, I think it covers about 40 kilohertz as it comes. But if you change it, put an extra capacitor or whatever and put a switch, you can get maybe an 80 kilohertz or so segment of 40 meters. So doesn't cover all the band, but you can get some quite good contacts with it. However, um, if you, um, it's only a little bit more, $115 instead of $80. Uh, I would strongly suggest instead, um, you look at the new one called the DCT, which stands for, it's still double sideband, but it's five watts output instead of two watts output. Um, it's got a DDS VFO, um, nice digital display there. Um, it also does CW. I, I tried it during one of the contests and, and it worked surprisingly well. Um, yes, the receiver is direct conversion, but the bandwidth, um, yes, the bandwidth is twice as wide, but um, 
it really does handle really well. Um, like, you know, it feels, sounds like a commercially made rig. Um, and I've had a lot of success. I think I tried, I think it might've been the RD contest or one of the contests I went in it and, and uh, did quite well. Um, I've done a review of both those rigs on my YouTube channel. Uh, with the um, DCT, it is a single band or both the rigs are single band. With the DCT on the right, um, you can either choose 80 or 40 meters. So um, 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 there's um, a choice there, but uh, that is a good rig to, um, and I think all the surface mount parts are already built on the board. So it's just the through hold parts. Um, but yeah, um, good. Another thing from OzQRP, especially if you've got your own box, is an MST3 which is an SSB rig, um, crystal, um, crystal filters in them. Um, again, single band, um, costs you a bit more. Um, you can, but the good thing about that, it draws less current on receive than the FT817. So if you wanted a dedicated um, rig for soda portable operating, where you want low power consumption, um, a good receiver, SSB as well, then that's something to consider. There's also uh, the QRP labs. Um, quite a few people have built them. More for a um, CW enthusiast um, that's uh, Hans Summers. Incredibly low cost, $49. And it's five watts output on CW as well as Whisper. So you can it can be your own Whisper beacon there. Um, there's a lot of very clever software in tied up with the DDS. Um, but it's called the QCX. Um, I don't think it, it doesn't come with the case, but I'm sure that there would be case options or you could build your own um, and you can choose from a single band. Um, then there's, uh, the, there's the ones you see on eBay um, for like, that's $3.63. They might be a little bit more, but a complete transceiver for $3.63. It's almost unbelievable. You can, you can even, you know, you probably can't buy the individual parts. Now. Like you get a BNC socket and LM386 and both of them, um, over the counter, they would cost more than $3.63, but here you've got a complete transceiver. Does it work? Well, sort of, um, but it's a bit frustrating. Um, you're very low power output, um, less than half a watt. It is crystal locked, which is a really big disadvantage. Uh, I'll talk about that later on. Basically with QRP, you've got to go and search other, for other people to call and make contacts. Um, your chances of success are much lower if you of trying to rely on other people to find you, um, which you basically are with crystal control. Um, the receiver is also very poor. It's, it's got quite a wide bandwidth and it can be overloaded. So um, I wouldn't recommend it as a practical QRP rig if you want to actually uh, have contacts and get success. Although your half watt output, that will still be heard over several hundred kilometers. Um, but, um, yeah, you require a lot of planets to align to easily get a lot of contacts on it. Um, it's, um, but if, if you want something, if you're starting out in building in construction, if you want a simple project, or even if you wanted to build a code practice oscillator that happens to transmit, then your Pixie is a possibility. Um, you could just have a meter or so of wire and talk across the room and uh, build a proper antenna and talk a few kilometers. So yeah, it's a, uh, um, uh, you'd get disappointed if you expect really good results, but if you build it as a construction project, learn how to build, learn how to solder, it's fantastic value for that. And there are various modifications you can do with the Pixie. Um, I've described a few on my website. Um, one of them is I converted it into an AM transmitter on 160 meters, so I did that and it sounded surprisingly good. And, and I think I, um, because you, I used the LM386 as a modulator to, um, it meant I didn't no longer have the receive function, but I could use the, I cut a few tracks on the board and I could use that to directly modulate the final stage and it sounded quite good. Um, another possibility is making it a frequency agile receiver by putting in a ceramic resonator so you can tune a bit of 40 meters. So um, yeah, it's, it's a fun little project. Um, if you're mainly an operator, there's better options. Um, the um, another thing uh, as well, which is coming in um, quite recently, there's now a few digital mode transceivers. If you know Morse code's an efficient mode, but not everyone likes it, and you can now um, 
you've got digital modes, FT8, um, JS8, um, and there's one from QRP guys um, in, in the States. It's $40 US, it's three bands on FT8, and it just you can just plug it into a laptop and have FT8 contacts on 40, 30, or 20 meters. Now, the main problem with it is it's double sideband direct conversion, which means that the signal is double sideband, so you're actually transmitting two signals, a desired signal that everyone will be listening for you, and an undesired signal a couple of kilohertz away down the band. And the other thing is that your direct conversion receiver will be responding to signals a couple of kilohertz, the other side of your suppressed carrier. So um, it's um, pretty much of a compromise, but I, as I'll mention later on, um, it, I, I have done experiments myself with homebrew gear and it, it can work, the concept can work. Or if you wanted something um, only slightly more, 55 US instead of 40 US, um, think what a phaser, SSB digital mode transceiver. Um, it's again available as a kit. The only thing is it's only mono band. Um, for a mode like um, FT8, um, you'd probably pick a band like 40 or 20 meters. Um, and um, the other thing is that there are JS8 versions available. Um, if you haven't tried JS8, a wonderful mode for QRP. Um, if I've got time, I'll talk about that. Um, it's a bit like FT8, but it's got many, it's, it, it's, it's a mixture of FT8, slow speed CW, packet radio, all these things in a, um, not dissimilar digital signal to FT8 because you can actually have proper text contacts. Whereas with FT8, it's very much um, your exchange of call signs, signal report, I think it's grid locator, and that's it. Um, you're in 15 second blocks. Whereas JS8, it's free text. You can um, you can type whatever you want, and you can um, um, if you go over your 15 seconds, then that's okay. You've, you've got you've got another 15 second block. Um, and you can um, leave messages for people. You can really, you can, you can do searches if there are people that are monitoring that might not be in front of their station. Then with JS8, you can um, put in commands and see what stations they've been hearing. And you can leave messages through people. Like if there is someone that you couldn't hear, then you might be able to leave a message for someone through another station. Um, it's really, really smart features and it's a, a free program. If you can use FT8 then, um, and you've got all the equipment for that, you can also use JS8. The software is called JS8 Call and I think their URL is js8call.com. Anyway, um, I, I reckon it's, it's far better than FT8. Um, it's got so many more features and it's far more personal. So that is a great mode for QRP and um, now you've got transceivers like the phaser that you can buy and connect it up to your computer. So uh, that's really exciting. That's only in the last maybe six months or a year. So uh, it's uh, one of the newer aspects of QRP. Um, another possibility is um, building yourself. Um, um, there are a lot of designs on the web. Um, a lot of them are designed or written by Northern Hemisphere people where there seems to be more activity there. Um, and here there are certain requirements, I think, that you, your rig needs to meet to have a reasonable chance of getting contacts. Um, I think 7 megahertz is a good band to use, uh, bearing in mind now that with the change license conditions, foundation licensees can now build equipment like this. Um, and uh, I think as for a requirement, um, frequency agile, really neat, as I mentioned before, um, you want to be able to tune the band, hear people calling CQ, tail end other people finishing a contact, um, give them a call, then chances are they'll come back to you and you'll get a contact. To do that, you need to be frequency agile um, to find stations to work. Um, I think you need more than a couple of watts power, um, maybe one watt on CW. Um, as well, you need a direct conversion receiver that doesn't overload. Um, the very cheap Pixie actually used the, um, I think it's the collector emitter junction of the final amplifier transistor as a diode detector, and it didn't have much of a front end tuned circuit, whereas a better type of direct conversion receiver might have a double balanced mixer with four diodes, or even an NE602. Um, they're not quite as strong as a double balanced mixer, but usually they're okay. So um, um, have a look for homebrew designs that 
feature of those. Um, there was a thing that I described on my website, vk3y.com, and there's, there's uh, a big long video I did. In fact, it's like about six parts of it that describes what I've called the Beach 40. Um, it's 40 meters, double sideband. You can buy pretty much all the parts in Australia. Um, even the ceramic resonator you can get from mini kits in South Australia. Um, the great thing about a ceramic resonator, um, you can get them for frequencies like 7.16 megahertz. You can shift it over like 100 kilohertz range of the band, or in fact more on 40 meters. So you cover pretty much all the SSB and 40 meters. So that you've got your frequency agility. It's tolerably stable on SSB. And with this, which is only like seven transistors in it, I've worked into New Zealand and VK6 just on uh, 40 meters. So um, that's um, a possibility if you wanted to um, build a, um, a simple uh, QRP rig. Um, the, uh, another possibility, something I've been um, doing a little bit recently, um, the great thing about home brewing is you might find something unusual in a junk box and, and that just happens to be the thing you need. You might be browsing through that cardboard box over there and again there might be a case, a plug, socket, component, board that you might have something and um, and that could get you interested in a particular project. So it's, it's uh, and of course you've got this wonderful institutions called tip shops that I don't need to, um, and I know there's one person in this room who I believe takes all the stuff so that the rest of you don't, guys don't get a fair go. So. Uh, um, yeah, lay off the tip shop and uh, let a few people, anyway, there's some amazing stuff in, in tip shops and things. Um, um, so that's half the reason for me coming down here. So, um, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, you can, some of the great things you might come across something that's really cheap that happens, just happens to be suitable for a homebrew transceiver. And one example, um, which I've described in this month's Amateur Radio magazine, and the thing you see there is that unit. Um, JS8, I mentioned how it was a, a great mode for keyboard digital communication um, and you could actually have chats. It's a bit like PSK31 but it's it's slower, a bit slower. It reminds me of slow speed Morse code. The transmitting speed is something like 12 words a minute um, and but it's really really penetrates weak signal, um, poor conditions. Um, a JS8 contact I had, I was using the FT817 and then I, um, I was making contact to a guy in VK6 on 80 meters and uh, anyway, we thought we'd go down in power and see how low we could go and he could get he could decode bits of my signal down down to about 30 milliwatts on 80 meters so um, and that's not, that's not a two minute thing on, on whisper this is actual text communication in a 15 second window on JS8. So it won't be quite as good as Whisper, but it is surprisingly good. Um, and it gives you real time keyboard to keyboard chats and all the other features. Anyway, um, possibility, and this could be something that could um, potentially be developed further to get foundation licensees on the air, um, especially now that they can use digital modes and homebrew gear. Um, you might have you've probably seen crystals in almost any old mo modem or computer board for 3.579545 or 3.58, near enough. Anyway, with those crystals, um, you know, TV colour burst crystals, they're in the 80 metre part of the band, which is great. But as it happens, the JS8 centre frequency happens to be 3.578. So the great thing about them is um, you're very close to that crystal frequency. And if you put a few crystals in parallel and a bit of inductance in series, um, it's a little bit harder on 80 meters than on 40 meters. Um, seven megahertz crystals are easy to pull down, a bit harder on 80 meters, but still you can get um, one and a half kilohertz lower down and therefore get yourself on 3.578. So you've got a very stable, um, um, signal source which can be your local oscillator for a direct conversion receiver and that direct conversion receiver was what I described in the latest amateur radio magazine now um, and it was it's, I can't remember it's basically like three or four transistors and if you connected it up to your laptop with the JS8 program then you could intercept JS8 communication um, with that setup um, the other great thing about it is that um, most, uh, if, you've, if you've already got the receiver going, then it requires very little extra to um, make it into a transceiver. Um, 
And so you've already got the local oscillator, which is the same frequency, it's direct conversion. Um, so you don't need to change that. You've got the balanced mixer, which you can use that for the receiver, as well as a double sideband transmitter. So that's all there. Um, then the only other parts you need are a couple of transistors to give you a bit of extra um, um, uh, as RF amplifier stages. And I've got on the front panel a switch. Um, it's very crude. I should replace that with a voice activated relay so that then you can have all the automated features that JS8 allows. But with the switch on the front panel, you sort of have to look at the computer screen and uh, when you go to transmit and receive, do it manually. But anyway, with a few transistors, you can be transmitting JS8 with a very simple crystal controlled transceiver on 80 meters. I haven't had any actual contacts with it yet, but I have been detected in New South Wales on it. So, and I have detected stations on the receiver. So it's just a matter of time of me getting around and uh, making contacts, but that is a very simple digital modes transceiver on 80 meters using a crystal that you possibly already have. Um, so that's a possible, you know, future project that uh, could, you know, um, be useful for QRP. Uh, it's not a huge amount of JS8 activity. Um, it's mainly on 40 meters, much more on 40 than 80, but the propagation characteristics of 80, particularly at this time of the cycle, would make it great for communication within VK7 and across to VK3. Um, another important thing with QRP, I've spoken about the equipment, um, but the equipment's only one thing. Um, all your other considerations, like your antennas and batteries, can easily weigh more than your transceiver, so important to think about those. Um, you want enough battery capacity to keep you talking for as long as you want. Um, now, personally, I, I, I like external batteries. From, even though the FT817 has an internal battery compartment, I don't use it. I have external batteries. And there's, you've got different choices. Um, probably the cheapest is the old sealed lead acid battery. Um, the 12 volt, seven amp hour, you know, super cheap. Um, but they're heavy, so that may not be a consideration, but if you're going, you know, going on SOTA ex expeditions and every kilogram counts, then yep, it is a, a um, fairly, um, you might not want to use that type of battery. NICAD, um, they're okay, but limited capacity. Lithium polymer, special um, chargers, apparently they can go bang if you don't look after them, so um, have a look on YouTube for videos of accidents with lithium polymer. Um, lithium iron as well, um, that's quite light um, and um, possibility um, if they're expensive but light, so that could be good for portable operating. As to what sort of battery you need, there's also LIFE PO4, and that's the type that I use. Um, a good compromise between them. A um, bit more expensive, their price is coming down, but um, um, they're quite light, so they're good for portable QRP. Um, as to how much capacity, um, it really depends on your transceiver. Um, uh, it's worth drawing up a power budget um, to work out, okay, you might need to be operating for a certain amount of time. You also need to know how much current your transceiver is using, both on receive and transmit. Um, and it can be surprising when you do the numbers because um, most of the time you, you also have to estimate how much time you're going to be spent receiving versus transmitting. And it's probably going to be 80% or more receive. And that is why receive current consumption is so important to designing, um, uh, working out what sort of batteries you want. Um, because the receive current consumption, if it's like one or two amps, like it might be for non-specialized QRP rigs, that could actually be chewing up most of your battery capacity you have um, if you're running it for several hours receive. So that's why um, a rig like the FT817, um, which draws like three or 400 milliamps, that's okay in most cases. But even so, when, when you um, look into um, the current consumption of things, I think having rechargeable batteries has really desensitized us to um, uh, how low a current you can build something and still work. Um, it, you know, if you look at consumer equipment, like trend, you know, consider a transistor radio from like you know, 1960s, 1970s, just you know, AM, maybe FM. Um, um, there's no digital synth frequency synthesizer. It's just a manual um, os um, free running oscillator. Um, anyway, something like that might only draw 10 or 20 milliamps. Um, 
I have built receivers using the, um, um, it used to be called the ZN414. You can still buy it, it's called the MK484. And it's basically a receiver and a chip, 10 transistors, TRF receiver. Anyway, I built a receiver in that and it draws something like two and a half milliamps. And, and if you look at, and that's just off a, I think it's one and a half volt battery. So if you work that out into, into watts, um, and you look at the amount of, you know, let's say a thousand or 2,500 milliamp hour of the battery, it, it, it will keep the radio going for something like a thousand hours or, or something like that. Um, and back in back when all we had was non-rechargeable batteries, um, the imperative was to build and design equipment that drew very little current, like just you know, a few milliamps, like say 10 milliamps for a receiver. I've received amateur signals on homebrew receivers that have drawn you know, less than five milliamps um, in a regenerative receiver. So you need to think about that. Okay, you might think the FT817 that draws 300 milliamps, you might think, yes, that draws a very small amount of current um, and it does compared with say an ICOM 703 that might draw two amps on receive. But um, it's one of the joys of QRP is not only the low power and transmitting, but how little power you need to actually um, pick up very weak signals from the other side of the world on receive. And that's where home brewing can come in because you can build low, super low power gear. And that also goes into your power budget. Um, some of the commercially made QRP rigs I um, mentioned before have very low current consumption. So on receive. So that's might be a, a key consideration if you're looking to buy a QRP rig. Um, very roughly with the 817818, um, you would allow, um, yes, you could do a power budget, or I'd allow just under one hour worth of operating per amp hour with a dedicated QRP rig. Um, um, if it was a higher power rig turned down, uh, like a 100 watt rig turned down to 10 watt, they are horrendously inefficient. They might be drawing, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, you know, they might be drawing 20 amps with 100 watts, but you drop down to 10 watts and they might still be drawing, you know, seven, eight, nine, whatever amps. So horrendously inefficient down on low power on transmit as well as receive. So that is a consideration if you're battery powered. First stage is to get your equipment that can draw as little power as possible um, and uh, draw up a power budget and allow a bit of extra, um, allow a bit of extra, you know, power budget, like assume that you're only going to be using half your power, not your full power, so that you, um, um, you build in a contingency factor um, and you'll never run out of power, or at least in theory, um, of course we all do. Um, and then uh, another, another thing to think about is antennas. Um, a lot of people associate with QRP with poor or tiny antennas. Um, there's, but there's no reason why you can't have a big step IR and your QRP rig. It's perfectly legitimate. Um, um, people say it's not in the spirit of QRP. They're complete, re completely wrong. Uh, you, know, you've, you know, do whatever is um, you know, <coughs> your regulations, your planning permits or whatever you can put up. Um, no reason why uh, you shouldn't be using a good antenna with QRP and get great results, um, including being, you know, other people might think you're like a 100 watt or more station with a good antenna. Um, it's worth looking at um, decibels and things and doing experiments. Um, of course, you've got a disadvantage of QRP compared with 100 watts. Um, 5 watts versus 100 is like 2S points below 100 watts and you can claw some of that back with a good antenna and or a good location or being there at the right time. Um, um, it's probably easier to talk about antennas to avoid um, because um, they're the antennas to avoid, they're the ones that for some reason have got a big loss that um, can make your QRP less than pleasurable. Um, so I find that it's hard to make an antenna that's much better than a half wave dipole but very easy to make one that's inferior. So dipole will work quite well. Um, no relationship between cost and performance. Um, in fact, expensive bought antennas, um, they are products designed to meet a particular solution. Um, and there are obviously enough suckers out there willing to, obviously people that don't buy my books, um, who are willing to buy some of them. Maybe it's for legitimate reasons, like very little space, but some of the really compact antennas do have a severe performance compromise, um, especially if they have to cover multiple bands, and especially if you want an antenna that, that um, 
can cover those bands without having to readjust something on the antenna or retune it or whatever. People love the idea of something that does, you know, three to 30 megahertz without having to tune on their transceiver. However, there can be severe compromises, especially with smaller antennas, if you go down that path. Um, I find dipoles shorter than three eighths of a wavelength, even if they're tuned feeder, um, the losses can pile up. That means for 80 meters, if it's less than 30 meters from end to end, I've found that the performance has, you know, does drop off significantly. G5 RV is okay, but um, you know, if you try to use a 40 meter dipole on 80 meters, even if you're feeding it with tuned feeder, I find it doesn't work very well at all. Um, um, but when you go above magic, you know, 70% of full, full size, then the performance really uh, starts to uh, improve. Um, another thing that's a risk are short end fed wires, like trying to load up 10 meters of wire on 80 meters. Um, it might be better than mobile whip, but it's uh, very much a compromise, especially if you've got a poor ground, um, ground everything with short end fed antennas. Um, so that's a real, if, if you can get to half a wavelength or even three eighths of a wavelength end fed, um, then you can take a few more compromises with the ground and still get contacts. Uh, another, another thing I suggest avoiding, particularly for portable operating, antennas with lots of parts to go hissing. Um, yeah, the, uh, um, like there's one, um, like, like you, you see mention of a thing called the, the buddy pole, and I, I've seen one once or twice, and there's all these little fine adjustments with taps and things on, on coils, so to change bands, um, be quite awkward and um, you're sort of telescoping lengths and things just to get things on onto resonant frequency so yeah um, you know if, if you're um, if you're setting up portable and it's and the rain's coming in or it's getting dark or whatever if you've got an antenna that will um, you know it only takes five minutes or less to dismantle then you'll be very thankful for that um, and um, the other thing is antennas that claim small size wide band with high efficiency. Um, yeah, you can have two, but you can't have all three. Um, yeah, um, no one's invented the miracle antenna that does all three. So you have to compromise on one of them. And with QRP, um, since you can't compromise too much on performance, you probably, bandwidth is probably the one you want to compromise on. Um, um, and then another thing is anything that's too heavy or complex, like traps, loading coils, etc., for portable operating, um, especially if you're using squid poles for antennas, because um, you can buy the lightest, thinnest type of hookup wire, and, and you can put that on a squid pole fine. Um, but as soon as you have traps and loading coils, because the squid pole, so the tops of them are like one millimeter in diameter, they're very fragile, and they will just bend over and reduce your height if you have any weight on them therefore good idea to avoid traps and loading coils that contribute that weight another thing i'd steer clear of is antennas with resistance for broadbanding as uh, the resistor will depending on the frequency will chew up a bit of your power um, which you can't afford um, antennas i've used um, if you've seen some of my videos i've, I've used quite a few of them um, the one I come back to a lot of the time, particularly on 40 meters, particularly if I'm not hugely seeking DX, um, an in-fed half-wave wire, about 20 meters long, and an L-match antenna coupler. Um, L-match is really easy to make. It's a lot smaller and lighter than a length of, say, RG58 coax that you'd otherwise need. Um, it can work on multi -ba multiple bands with a coupler. Um, you, can, you could, if you wanted to, tap the wire for different lengths if you did want to run a, a half wavelength on 20 meters rather than a full wavelength with your 20 meters of wire. Um, but yeah, I, overall I've just found that about a half wavelength on 40 meters works quite well for some of the higher bands as well. For 80 meters though, I would prefer to add a bit more extra length. Um, if you can add another 20 meters to make it half wavelength there, then that's probably a good thing. Um, another possibility, um, particularly for DX, is a full wavelength delta loop, um, a third of a wavelength per side. Um, you can just have a single support, so you have a triangle like that. Um, if it's over the water, I'd suggest feeding it a quarter wavelength down from the apex of the top, so it's a twelfth of, of a wavelength above your bottom corner. So you've got a feed point quite near the bottom, which is handy mechanically. Um, but that gives you vertical polarization, which especially if you're over salt water, 
um, you can set it up on a pier and that can give you quite good results. Um, that antenna can also be multi-band. Um, um, you know, you can, it can be, um, um, oh, sorry, um, um, you, if, especially if you feed it with open wire line, you can tune it for multiple bands. It doesn't have to be a full wavelength around. It can be a little bit under, like a, a full wavelength delta loop on 14 megahertz will work fine on 10 megahertz, 30 meters, where it's about two thirds its size, but I wouldn't use, use it on 40 meters, its efficiency will drop off. But if you wanted to try it on 15 meters and your antenna coupler works okay, then it would be okay there. Um, another possibility is, it's very simple to put up, is a vertical on a pier. Uh, a normal squid pole might go nine meters tall, which is near enough to a quarter wavelength, um, especially if you've got an antenna coupler. Um, aim for between about a quarter wavelength and five eighths of a wavelength in its length. You know, half wavelength vertical is fine. Um, that is very high impedance, so you will definitely need a L-match antenna coupler for that. Um, and you can just have a bit of thin wire up a squid pole and you can get squid poles between five meters and nine meters. Um, another possibility, um, center fed dipole and variance, very simple, basic, nothing wrong with it, especially for a single band. Link dipole is great for multiple bands. Um, main problem is you have to, um, not so good for a contest where you're having to change bands um, a lot. So for casual SOTA or parks operating, a link dipole is great. I think most people in, into that use it, um, where you're only occasionally changing bands, but for a contest, if you're changing bands more than there's other, um, other antennas you can use. Um, traps and loading coils, yeah, they do work, but they add bulk, which can be a consideration if you're using a squid pole and wire. Um, tune feeder dipole is efficient, good on over multiple bands, but requires a balanced coupler. Although having said that, I did a video recently where I tried an unbalanced coupler, an L-match, and it still worked. Um, um, so yeah, um, um, but ideally you want balanced antenna, balanced feed line, balanced coupler, ideal. Um, and then there's other possibilities like um, half square and bi square. Now, um, bi square is um, a huge antenna, even for 10 meters. It is. Um, um, you'd almost think it was like a quad loop, but it's not actually a single continuous loop. It is split at the top, fed at the bottom, and it's the same size as a, it's basically two wavelengths of wire. Um, it's got a little bit of gain, but it's massive and it requires a huge pole, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend. In contrast, the half square, especially if you're down by the beach um, and want something that is not very high, um, maybe you've only got a couple of nine meter squid poles, not very high, vertically polarized, low angle of radiation, a bit of gain, broadside, half square is a good antenna. Um, all it is, is again, our magic 20 meters of wire, uh, very useful length, um, but this is on, on 20 meters. It's full wavelength of wire. You basically have a quarter wavelength up, um, which is only five meters. If we're building one for 14 megahertz, half wavelength across, so it's 10 meters across, and then another quarter wavelength down. So it's 20 meters of wire total, and that will give you um, quite a good antenna on 20 meters. Um, you'd feed it um, with a little L-match antenna coupler as it will be, it's one wavelength, it will be high impedance. Um, you can have a small ground counterpoise, something like that. And particularly near salt water or over a pier, that is quite a good low angle DX antenna. So um, the other thing about it is it's only a quarter wavelength high. So potentially if you had a, um, um, a 10 meter pole, you could, make one even for 40 meters and, uh, and you know, to get your quarter wavelength and it would be okay. Um, and um, there's for materials. Um, uh, you don't need very many materials, but I reckon a squid pole is pretty key. Um, yes, you can throw things up over a tree, but um, the um, problem is you really need to know your site. There might not be very many trees where you're operating. It might be a public area and people don't like you, you know, if you've got people um, don't like you seeing things throwing, throwing stuff over trees. So, uh, um, yeah, um, where or where I am by the beach, um, you know, the, the trees are only about this high. So um, a pole is um, a great accessory to carry along. Preferably one. Um, there's a much wide, wider range of antennas you can build and erect if you have two squid poles. Doubles the weight. So it's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, the... Um, 
some other useful bits of um, things, plastic chopping, kitchen chopping board. Now, um, there doesn't seem to be anyone, anyone uh, a chopping board here. Maybe someone's pinched it for an antenna. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, um, but yeah, um, real, it's a really good material. And I don't know about tip shops, but op shops, you know, look, um, op, look at op shops and things because um, some of the chopping boards new, some of them you see can be like five or six dollars, which um, is, is you know, too expensive. And you can find a worn one in an op shop for like, you know, may, maybe a dollar. May, maybe in Tasmania it would be 50 cents. Or, or, or is, is there a Tassie tax where things are more expensive here? Or, yes. or uh, is that true on second hand things or are second hand things? cheaper um depends on the tip shop yeah okay yeah um now tip shops dearer than the salvos or the red cross i They're becoming. okay 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 so so tip shops are uh, um for um uh, for, for gentrified people like like you okay um all right okay so it looks like the um the, the op shops um where, where you go and get um um chopping board so so get some chopping board and they're really easy to work with get a hacksaw um um and um and chop them up into little bits. Um, they work quite well as spreaders for open wire feed line, which is great, or antenna insulators or centers for dipoles, um, um, great. Even lighter, um, you know, and I, I hear that, you know, Hobart's going through a bit of a property boom, so you, you might not be seeing them on too many houses for long, but those plastic core flutes, if a, you know, if, if a house sells in five minutes, then just find the core flute that pointing to the house and, uh, and uh, souvenir it if, um, and uh, yeah, and, and cut it, no, no, cut into lots of little bits and, um, and then you have a super light, super strong material for making spreaders for open wire feed line. It's even thinner than, um, and lighter than chopping board. It's surprisingly robust and strong material. Um, in fact, I built an antenna coupler <laughs> using core flute material and I used a variable inductor using a ferrite rod from a radio that slid in and out of this core flute because I was able to get these um, thin, these scissors, only certain types of scissors worked. They need to be really thin pointy scissors. But anyway, I could cut through some of the sections of the core flute. Um, so I was able to merge some of the holes and that provided a tight fit on the ferrite rod. And then I um, drilled with one to half, one millimeter holes or so. The same drill bit you use for your printed circuit boards. You just drill them maybe 10 holes or so either side of the hole that you've made for your sliding rod and that will make you a continuously variable inductor just by sliding the um, um, you won't get a huge range i think i got about one and a half to about five or six micro henry but that variable inductor is enough to make a l match antenna coupler for 20 meters 40 meters and a few of the bands so um core flutes are you know uh, you know, people talk about roller inductors and all that. For QRP, you can make your own with um, a core flute that you swipe from the real estate. So, um, yeah, uh, and a ferrite rod. Um, so, yeah, good good material. Um, fishing line as well. Velcro strip, um, a roll like that. Um, I don't know if you can get it from Bunnings. You can certainly get it from eBay. But, yeah, but you can use that to lash your squid pole to your fence railing or something. Um, thin hookup wire, um, preferably copper. Um, but thinnest stranded wire, like the cheap stuff that JCAR sells, where you know, so so when you go and buy my book, you also buy some thin hookup wire uh, from JCAR, and that will be fine for an in-fed wire antenna. Um, there's I have there has, there is also other types of wire like um, that green gardening wire stuff. Now it's not copper. I have used it as an antenna, and it does work. Um, it's a bit rigid if you're really um stuck and you'd left your wire at home then yes you'd use it but otherwise um, um just a temporary thing like if you, you sometimes see that sort of wire at two dollar shops or whatever um, and that's um, a possibility um i've spoken about telescoping squid poles there's different lengths you can get um there's um you know five meter lengths some of them collapse down to this this short in fact i think there are even lengths of like eight or nine meters that you know have multiple sections that again uh, collapse quite short and that could be useful if, if you're traveling um, and uh, as for things to avoid um, at least for HF QRP if you can avoid coax cable particularly RG58 or thicker that adds a great deal of weight to your pack um, bulky antenna couplers um, 
Um, yep, they're great for high power in the shack, but um, for QRP they can be bigger than your transceiver, so not ideal. Bulky VSWR meters, um, what you've got in the 817, it's only a relative reading indicator, but that is fine. Heavy balance, no, nah, I don't need them. Antenna analyzers, don't worry about them. Um, basic thing is question every gram. Does it add to your signal or not? Um, there's some people that take accessories like things like Morse keyers or bulky headphones or um, other things. Um, and the question is, does it add to your signal or not? If it doesn't add to your signal, leave it home. Um, it's, um, and uh, um, as for supporting antennas, um, yep, um, I've mentioned squid poles, um, or, or you could just use fishing sinkers and throw line over. People might not like that, so um, um, might not be a good idea. Um, I have tried kite antennas. Um, a single kite can support, you know, say, 40 metres of wire, and it can give you great results on a band like 160. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, depends on the kite. Sometimes um, it's better if you're a two-person operation, so you've got one person to look after the kite and the other to do the operating. But there have been times, you know, some kites... Um, there was a kite that Audi sold that was like $6 anyway, one particular type. It stayed in the air for something like 40 minutes or, or something, um, and I, I could operate and had quite a few contacts with it. So um, Then there are other types of kites that um, compact really small that don't have metal frames. Um, um, it's sort of self-supporting. Um, a guy in America was uh, very generous the other, the other month, and he sent me this kite. Uh, there's this huge mailing tube arrived at my front door. And anyway, um, wondered what was in it. And there are all these uh, metal boxes of M&Ms. Um, that was what was contributing most of the weight and, and all these other lollies and things. Of course, they were eaten first. I think the idea of the metal boxes was as projects and project cases and anyway. Um, but really the, the main thing that he sent was, um, was this kite, which I um, did a video a couple of months ago on it. And it was surprisingly good actually. Uh, um, it was a frameless kite, so if you're into something really light and compact, then that is something to consider. Um, uh, I wouldn't have any more than five-eighths of a wavelength um, of wire on it, otherwise the radiation pattern changes and becomes higher angle. Um, good idea, you, even though there's not a thunderstorm present, you can sometimes get static and uh, things off your wire. Good idea to have a bleeder resistor going down to earth, of, say 100k or mega ohms, something like that. Um, uh, of course, the other thing is you need a large open space, otherwise your kite will be caught up in trees and uh, public areas. So that's a uh, um, um, main limitation. So for something like SOTA, probably not. Um, but if you want to do tests on 160 meters and DX, and e even you know, early in the morning, um, provided you've got the wind, then a kite is a great antenna, as Marconi found. Um, and the antenna, um, second from the bottom, that is actually a half square that I described before. Um, um, two poles, one wavelength apart and a quarter wavelength up. Um, if you're using the kite as a quarter wave, you've got to put a ground? Yes, you do. Um, so that's where sports ovals can be good, like there was some sort of soccer net thing that I used. Um, yeah. This is on 160 metres AM, like there's a session in, in Melbourne, 11 o'clock um, uh, Monday to Saturday, 160 metres AM and people get on and um, and there was a guy who recorded my signal from, I don't know, there's like 50 kilometres away. And the kite was up. And I, I, and, and this is just this 10 watts from a converted Seacom. I was a huge signal, like a broadcast station, way stronger than anyone else. And then the kite came down and just the signal just dropped down to nothing. So, um, yeah, can definitely an efficient antenna um, if you can. As far as matching the antenna goes, you can feed it with coax. Um, Good for a single band, multiple bands, um, less so. It's um, um, RG174 can save a lot of bulk. Um, uh, it's loss, it's it's tolerable on the HF bands, VHF not so much. A small antenna coupler though, something like this, you could build something small enough to plug in to the antenna socket on, on your transceiver. Or you could even build, if you've got a single band QRP rig, you can even build an L match straight into the back panel of your QRP rig. You could even have a little switch and two antenna and uh, a couple of binding posts and be switching the antenna coupler in. Um, 
like all it is like for 40 meters if you're just using a half wavelength of wire you could um you could probably have you know a fixed inductor of about 4.7 microhenry and a uh, um, variable capacitor like a transistor radio type and that will match quite a few antennas um so yeah i've described a few antenna couplers um another possibility um i've used the small rf chokes that uh, you can buy from Altronics and jcar they do work but i found on digital modes with five watts they can burn out um, um especially 100 percent duty cycle ssb is a bit more forgiving um Another possibility is to use toroids and have switches shorting across them. You could have, um, it's not quite as good as a roller inductor, but pretty good. You could have a switch, you know, 0.5 of a microhenry, 1 microhenry, 2 microhenry, 4 microhenry, 8 microhenry. That gives you, you know, 8 or 16 steps, um, like binary steps, so you can get very close to spot on, especially in conjunction with the variable capacitor. So that's a good approach. Um, Automatic antenna couplers, personally I suggest avoiding them, they're expensive for what they are, you'll get no better results than with something that requires two or three components and they won't necessarily match as wide a range as with a manual coupler and also they don't contribute a single dB of signal, uh, you, you're better off spending your money on a taller mast. Um, so um, I've talked a lot about the station, what about making contacts? I, I, um, um, now some people of course um, don't have success with QRP, uh, it can be due to a lossy antenna, bad choice of band or frequency or poor operating. It can sometimes be, um, sometimes people uh, if you're very new, foundation licensees might have difficulty with 10 watts. So I talk about that in a lot of detail in, uh, in, um, in this book as well as in my book Minimum QRP. But basically important thing is tune the band first. Um, get an idea of the general conditions and where it's open to. Ch take note of any beacons and call signs, look people up where they are, and then you'll get an idea of the conditions. In tune the band again, then you're more attentive, um, especially you want to ideally be listening for stations calling CQ, about to, which you probably won't hear anyone. Then there might be others that are about to finish a contact. Um, um, so take a note of that frequency um because that could be useful later on or maybe there are people that are making really quick contacts again that could be useful later on they present opportunities to call stations that you know are listening so um best ways to make contacts with qrp um first of all if there are any cq people calling cq then obviously try to answer them um if there aren't then next tail end contacts uh, because you know that there's people normally don't switch off immediately after finishing a contact um, so yeah, so that's why it's so important to listen for contacts about to finish because you need to be and, and be tuning across the band and just see how the contact is progressing and, um, and, and so you can be right there when the contact finishes and you can pounce in and, uh, and, and call someone. Um, and then as well, people making very quick contacts, again, there's an opportunity for you to jump in. Uh, timing is really important. On one hand, you don't want to delay yourself so much that you're not talking at all and everyone's switched off, but you don't want to be talking over the top of other people. Um, some people do not necessarily end contacts very cleanly. Some people can take you know, 10 minutes or more to say 73, it's amazing, but you know. Um, um, so, so yeah, um, so you have to develop an art through practice and listening of timing so you it's no good with QRP talking over the top of someone else because um, if you're the lower power station, then others will probably be stronger. So you want, you know, the trick is that other people are listening and you're in the clear. Um, then once the contact is established, first thing is you've got to get your call sign across. Um, do not, um, um, and make sure the other guy's got your call sign right. Um, if, there's, if you don't have your call sign across, then it's not a valid contact and they might be giving other information like their name or whatever. Don't give your name or anything else until you know the other station's got the call sign right. Then after then you can. Um, but yeah, call signs exchange is absolutely important. Um, and, uh, and you keep repeating it until you get through. Frequency agility, as I mentioned before, is absolutely king. Um, generally with QRP, you must find and call people often on their frequencies rather than expecting them to find you if your signal is, is weak. So that's why frequency agility is so important. Um, 
As for conditions, are they really that bad? Um, yep, long distance DX is, is hard. More, that's more than 3,000 kilometers. Um, but still, there's a lot of people um, less than 300 kilometers, you know, ZL, other VK that you can still hear and, and work. Um, digital modes offer an advantage. Um, gray line on lower HF bands early in the morning or you know, um, around sunset as well. Um, you can still easily make, just even though you might officially have a sunspot count of zero, you can still easily work 3,000 kilometers on 80 through to 20 meters. Just be aware that you know, bands like 40 meters um, during the day, um, you, you don't get your closer in stuff during the low sunspot period. Um, whereas um, um, when I came here about five or six years ago, I was on 40 meters and working people all around VK7. In fact, there was a surprising number of VK7s on, on the air. Um, on, on 40 meters, but um, now with the longer distance propagation, you might hear people in uh, you know, South Australia, New South Wales, um, uh, more than others in on 80 on 40 meters. So yeah, you've got the changes in your skip zone. So a band like 80 meters might be um, better. Um, and I've done surprisingly well, you know, working to even 80 meters during the day. Not many people on it, but that has a lot of potential. Um, including with say that digital modes transceiver could be could be quite good i think for 80 meter contacts within vk7 during the day um, at the current phase of the cycle um, then of course um, and and we've still got we're at the tail end of summer but there's still uh, activity on 10 and 6 meters um, can be great with qrp um, um, that's still active with some great contacts um, there's, there's a guy from vk3 vk3 xp2 who's got a little handheld and he, he came down to VK7 um, a few weeks back and he was easily working people on the mainland just with a handheld on 10 meters and of course you can and quite a few people in this room know you can still work a lot of VHF UHF microwave so still lots of opportunities for QRP <coughs> even if you've got sunspots of zero. Um, HF pedestrian mobile um, yeah I, I live by the beach so it's great to have salt water uh, around and and I've done a bit of pedestrian mobile, mainly using two types of antennas, one a magnetic loop and the other a vertical. Um, 40 meters overall is the best band um, for contacts within VK. A um, bit of a novelty as well, um, and which I enjoyed. Um, 20 and 30 meters can be good. I have worked across to the States and Europe on 20 meters. Uh, again, this was a few years ago when conditions were a bit better. While I've been pedestrian mobile on SSB on 20 meters, um, just running five watts. Um, so um, 80 meters, I've tried it, very difficult, but still need more refinement in the antennas. 10 meters is fantastic for pedestrian mobile um, this time of year. And also six, overall, if you were to choose between one of the bands, I'd go with 10 meters, more people on it and um, more activity but yeah six can be a lot of fun as well even two meters 70 centimeters ssb you can work pedestrian mobile um, and you will get questions from passers-by um, and um, um, so be prepared to answer those and uh, but you know, part of the fun of it as well is the novelty factor of the guy on the other end you're probably going to be the first pedestrian mobile station they've worked on hf um, mm -hmm. so um, yeah that's uh, my two antennas um, it's a magnetic loop. Uh, it's made from aluminium strip you can get from Bunnings. I think that's a three meter length, so I didn't need to cut it. You just bend it into a thing that looks like a giant stop sign. Um, and that will work on seven foot of 28 megahertz. Um, there's a variable capacitor at the top. Um, if you wanted to cover the higher bands, um, like for the sporadic E season over summer, then it's a good idea. You know, it's worth having a smaller loop as well, which is a little bit less unwieldy, um, about 40 centimetres in diameter. Another possibility, um, um, this is fine if, you are, um, if, if you're not by the beach, if you're just in ordinary um, suburbia because you're not having to worry about ground, whereas the vertical is better if you're over the water um, because ideally you need your earthing thing to be in contact with the water. And this is five metres of a wire um, you can't see it, but there is a loading coil that I switch in. Um, um, the five meters of wire is fine for 10 megahertz through to 50 megahertz with a little L-match antenna coupler. But for seven megahertz, it's not long enough to be efficient. But I did find that a small loading coil, it's center loaded. Um, yeah, that, that works, um, that allows it to work quite well on seven megahertz. So um, 
Uh, I've had contacts into New Zealand, um, you know, um, you know, seven one thirty DX net. You know, most people will hear you uh, at least within that range uh, with this sort of setup. So that that can be a lot of fun, um, and there's video demonstrations of it. Um, if we've got some time, and if we're connected online, I can give you a demonstration of some QRP contacts. All right, so that's um, gets pretty much towards the uh, towards the end. Basically, uh, the summary is um, QRP works most of the time with pretty much all facets of amateur radio um, and uh, maybe EME might be uh, might be a bit of a struggle but uh, um, otherwise mo no. most things yeah. three milliwatts so three milliwatts can... well yeah. there you are um, <laughs> equipment's plentiful and cheap um, <laughs> operating technique really really important um, carry that on your back mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah operating yeah, technique sorry. really really important um, and uh, there's various activities you can do means that um, um, it's not barely affected by the sunspot cycle um, because there are a lot of other frequencies and bands and options. Um, for further information, there's a um, um, VKQRP club I'd highly recommend. Um, $15 a year membership and you get the four magazines per year. Um, some people in here might be a member. So, yep, um, based in VK5, they've also got a page on Facebook. So, join, um, so uh, look at the VKQRP club. Um, there's also my website, there's a bit about QRP at vk3y.com and uh, my YouTube channel. Um, I've written a few books about QRP. Um, probably the one that's most, um, that elaborates a lot on this talk is Minimum QRP. Um, that's uh, a lot of, not, ma not many circuits, I don't think there's any circuits, but there's a lot on operating techniques and uh, um, the various things you can do with QRP, ideas for antennas, etc. Um, for more detail on the antenna side, which is important, there's hand-carried QRP antennas. It's been a huge, uh, both these have been huge sellers, you know, thousands worldwide have been sold, both these books. And um, just recently launched in the last month or two is a successor to hand-carried QRP antennas called More Hand-Carried QRP Antennas. And that is more... Um, practical side, particularly the higher HF bands, like 28, 50 megahertz, lower VHF bands. Um, that's some of my more recent antenna experiments. So uh, um, some of the antennas I've described here have been very simple little oblong loops that I've tried with Whisper with quite good results um, on two motors. So um, yeah, um, that's books I've written on QRP. You can have a look at them through my website. Um, and you, there's reviews of what people have said about them on Amazon. So you can get them as an ebook or um, in other countries as uh, paperback as well. Um, the other thing as well, um, and which we can get as a paperback, now JCAR stores, is um, the Australian Ham Radio Handbook. It um, pretty much takes off from where the foundation license manual um, finishes. Foundation license manual is great for people um, getting their foundation license, passing the test, but um, it doesn't go a lot further than that. Um, whereas this book pretty much um, uh, covers you a lot about, um, it's very, you know, as the title suggests, very Australian based. Um, Dick Smith actually wrote a very similar book about 40 years ago. You, you might have seen it called the um, Dick Smith Australian Amateur Radio Handbook. Um, the big seller, you might sometimes see them at ham fests. And, uh, and this book is a similar um, type concept to that, but updated for 2020 or 2019. And um, it's... Um, um, gives you a lot of the different facets of amateur radio, very Australian focused. There's a lot of um, you know, Australian specific details like all these obscure suppliers you probably haven't heard of are listed in here. Um, basics on setting up a station, uh, um, stuff about um, clubs and Facebook groups where you can find further information. A lot about operating and getting contacts, um, repeaters, satellites, various facets. So, uh, yeah, that's um, you can get it as an ebook um, again via Amazon or from uh, JCAR as well um, for twenty four ninety five. So, really pleased that um, you know we've now got a locally produced Australian amateur handbook, and it's so widely available. So, uh, that's something that uh, you could be interested in. Um, okay, do we have any questions? Yes. Yep. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it's funny that people um, ask you whether, whether you're looking for um, 
aliens or whether you're a spy or whether you're a tourist? And I answer yes, of course. Um, um, <laughs> you ever been accused of electrofishing? Um, no, um, but I think someone thought I was tracking animals and yeah, yeah um, at one time. I noticed you had uh, earlier there, and uh, I came in a bit late, so I'm not sure if you already covered on, but you were talking about um, half wave end bed mm. antennas. Have you had much success with those, especially yeah. when they're not necessarily as high as they optimally should be? Um, I, I've, um, I've had overall net half wave N fed's my favourite antenna. Um, for forty metres, particularly, I found they work quite well. Generally, the height I usually use is the I have them like an N fed inverted V. So in the middle, which is the highest point, is about eight or nine metres tall, which is where the squid pole is. I haven't tried them really low. I suspect that performance would be a bit less when they're lower. But yeah. Um, so when you said so you put an end fit up as an inverted fit. Yes, yes, um, because that's the easiest because you can tie off the end to a tree or a fence or whatever and the other end of the inverted V is where your transceiver is So, and you just have the pole in the middle. So yeah. Um, is it necessary to be particularly straight or does it not really matter that much? Um, well, it's, it's not straight, it's sort of like an inverted V. So yeah, no, it doesn't matter too much. Um, it's... Um, yeah. No, was, uh, somebody might have noticed that the 160 meter end bit we have here is hanging a bit low tonight. Uh, now, 160 meters is a different. 160 meters is a different kettle of fish because your propagation uh, mechanism. Like, if you're trying for like, like the end fit I normally use on on 40 meters is fine. If you're trying to work people from say, f um, there's a big band of distances on 40 meters which are really easy to work. Like, um, depends on the solar activity, but it might be say. 200 to 1,000 kilometres, and that r band uh, relies on a relatively uh, a medium to high angle of radiation and um, um, from your antenna, whereas 160 metres, um, it, it depends on whether it's during the day or at night. If it's during the day, you want a vertical antenna for ground wave coverage, like which is what the AM stations rely on, and for DXing um, vertical for um, longer distance, low angle stuff is good. Um, whereas a horizontal dipole or, or, or horizontal end fed for 160 might not be so good. It won't, won't be much good for local ground wave stuff and, it, and being close to the ground it won't necessarily be very good for DX but there'll be certain intermediate distances of maybe 200 kilometres that I've had that that type of antenna will work quite well on 160. So 160 is a bit more selective, I find. Like, depends on the distances you want to work and the propagation modes um, as to whether a horizontally polarised end fed antenna is a good choice or not. Um, can, can you describe the way tenor? Mm. Um, because you've obviously got something yep. the ground that goes down to your... Yep, do we have a whiteboard? Okay. Right. Okay. Um, low tenor. Basically, um, the basic form is ignore the switch there. Um, it's five meters, which is a quarter wavelength on 14 megahertz, half wavelength on 28 megahertz, and intermediate on other bands. Um, this is an L match antenna coupler that goes to your transceiver here. Um, and so it's your basic end fed wire. Now for the um, um, grounding thing here, all we've got is just a bit of hookup wire. This is a, I think it's a poached egg ring, but anyway, it's an aluminium um, thing about this, this big. And, and I, I sort of sort of slot in it. And the idea is that it is held underneath the salt water. Uh, it's really important that it does make contact with the salt water. It doesn't matter whether you are and so the idea is that you wear that around your ankle and then you have your um, transceiver in a bag. Um, of course, your transceiver must always be above the water line. Um, um, <laughs> and then you have this assembly in a backpack. And that's where I used, a, I actually used a chopping board that I did not chop up um, inside the backpack. And then I attached that to 
a bit of conduit and into that conduit slides a, uh, a telescoping squid pole, only about five meters. So it's a shorter squid pole that collapses down to about that amount. So, so that fits in, in your backpack. In fact, it fits in that backpack there. And um, that, and you wear that on your back. So that's where your antenna is. And um, so you've got your little antenna coupler that connects straight to the antenna socket of the FT817, uses the front socket. Um, I don't particularly like supporting things on the front socket of an FT817. You shouldn't do it unless it's very light, which this coupler is. Um, it's just built on a few pieces of circuit board. And there's a rotary switch here and a toyed inductor, so that's just an L-match. Um, and yeah, the uh, um, this is held in the salt water and it's just uh, one of those Velcro strap I mentioned uh, just tied around your ankle so you need to be walking through the water for it to work. Um, if you are, um, I find it's particularly important on 40 meters, uh, 43 to 20 meters, the lower HF bands, um, it makes huge difference if you walk out of the water, um, the signals drop hugely. Um, you know, it could be like three or four S points, um, and it makes a huge difference between people whether people can hear you or whether they cannot hear you um, on on 40 meters. On 10 meters, it's not so much. Um, bearing in mind, on 10 meters, this is a half wavelength. As I mentioned before, for 40 meters, that's one thing about it um, is that the five meters is only one. Um, well, it's, it's one eighth of a wavelength on 40 meters. I've got a center loading coil, which is actually just a bit of um, plastic conduit with some hookup wire um, around it. And that just slips over the pole as well. And there's a switch across that. So it's only on 40 meters that I have that coil switched in. Otherwise I have it switched out. And um, yeah, the, uh, um, um, so yeah, as soon as you uh, walk out of the water, it makes a difference. Another difference is that if you're if the sole of your foot's on wet sand, it, it's sort of, the signals are choppy. It's almost like a two meter FM signal that's noisy. Um, when, you're not, um, when you're not touching the sand, the signal is, is weak. And when you are touching the sand, it's stronger, but it's, um, therefore you need to be walking through the water for it to be consistent. Um, um, but yeah, there's, um, but if you come to a pier or something like that and there's railing, then you can just touch that onto the um, railing of the pier and you'll get a similar result. To if you're walking through the water so that's an option if you have a pier with a metal railing when you say walking through you yep. could be standing still though. yes oh yeah that's fine yep yeah. yep um or you could have one on both ankles when you're walking that, that that's true but it's it's really a very it's a, um really very poor performance yeah the sand's a bit stronger but it's really better to be in the water ankle to knee deep water as we you, you i think you commented in one of your um either write-ups or a video mm. that getting a little uh, RF buzz at some point. Uh, I don't think I did, no. Oh, okay. Um, no, someone no. might have commented on it, but no, I, I haven't felt anything. Okay. Um, um, yeah. I, and I wouldn't recommend this for anything more than QRP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, you know, and, and, and probably a low duty cycle mode like pedestrian. I haven't tried pedestrian mobile slow scan TV, but you know. Um, That's the next <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't like the idea of dropping phones and things into the water, uh, you know, whatever. But uh, um, yeah, um, a possible variant of it, and people have had good results, is um, some sort of ground tuning unit where you've got a counterpoise and then a, I think it's a series tuned circuit and you tune it for maximum current so you could have that suspended above the water. Um, so yeah, the. Uh, um, but overall, um, that's better than a magnetic loop if you've got access to the water. For particularly for 40 meters. Um, in fact, I, I think it's um, close to being, the performance is close to being a full-sized antenna um, on 40 meters because um, particularly for some of the longer distance stuff like VK3 to VK2, there's been times when I haven't heard the VK2 callback all that well, although they've heard me and I think it's because this might have a lower angle of radiation than say a low horizontal antenna. So for that distance of a thousand kilometers, this might start to come into its own as being a better antenna. So um, 
yeah, I have worked into Europe on not much recently, not at all recently, but to Europe on 20 meters with this arrangement. I, I haven't really sought a lot of decks. I have done contests like John Moyle or RD contest with this arrangement. The main problem is, you know, it's easy to get the contacts. Logging is, is the problem. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, um, is there a reason why you don't just drag the wire in the wire? I have tried it. Um, um, dogs go chasing after it. Uh, when, when you drag it along the sand, in fact, the first thing, I, I did some videos on this. The first thing, before I had this, I did have a wire trailing behind me, but I found that ground characteristics of the sand and whether it's dry or wet or whatever, meant I was always adjusting the antenna coupler. Whereas with this, with it being in the water, it's a constant setting, so I didn't need to vary it. You could, yes, and, and then of course uh, uh, he would run away and get excited and your train C would go off with him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so... Um, Have you ever thought of taking that exact same rig and transferring it to sitting on the bow of a tinny? Um, that would be good, yeah. yeah. It would work extremely well, um, it's no doubt. Yeah. You yeah, you'd just attach it. Yeah, mm. yeah, no, it'd be, it'd be fantastic. You'd, you'd do extremely well. well. I was wondering, at what point does the proximity of the lead and the uh, bow of the titty start to come into play when you, you're starting to get a bit of uh, lack of separation between the radiating side of the antenna oh, and the ground? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Never. Um, um, pretty good. Um, I, I, if you're not near a beach and if you, you know, don't have a very good ground system, um, although magnetic loop is a compromise, a vertical relying on a very poor ground system is probably even more of a compromise. And um, there's, um, um, I know that VK5 SFA has built this huge magnetic loop, wonderful. And I, I've, I've heard them on a crystal set um, with, them. I think I'm, um, on 80 meters. I, admittedly, I think it might have been a one transistor audio amplifier attached with it, so it wasn't a pure crystal set. But and then I had this BFO as a local oscillator, so I could hear his SSB, but I could hear him on that. So um, um, yeah, if you go to a lot of trouble, um, basically conductivity is absolute key. Minimising all your DC losses that means uh, really good engineering, and that can sometimes conflict with the requirement to be light and hand carried for QRP. Still, um, for pedestrian mobile, if I wasn't by the beach, I would just be using my magnetic loop. And, and I, I've had some good results on 40 meters and 20 meters carrying the magnetic loop. It's also much safer in a residential area. Like with this, you'd never use it in a residential area because of power lines and trees and other things. Whereas the magnetic loop um, is, is much lower and you can also null out interference on receive, which is good. So. Yeah, um, it won't be as good as a full-sized antenna unless it's really well engineered, like um, the VK5s. But for pedestrian mobile, it's it's been quite good. You mentioned uh, squid poles. I have purchased a couple from Haverford. Yes. Yep. And they make a multi-purpose one. Mm -hmm. And rather than being one and a half or two millimeters at the tip with a little sort of eyelet for, mm -hmm. the, for the fishing line, mm -hmm. uh, the top is actually eight millimeters. Okay, yeah. And it's really rigid. Mm. I've got a pair of them. Uh, I have a full length of wire mm. going into a, uh, a multi-band automatic antenna yeah, tuner. Yeah. It works reasonably mm. well. Just stuck in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. So, so that would be a good choice if you're, you know, if you've got, you know, trapped dipoles or, or, or something with coax feed line or maybe something with a bit more weight, but yeah. Um. I'm planning on using it and getting a little wire up in a tree. Hmm. Hmm. Any further questions for Peter? Can we show our appreciation? Oh,